Good morning. Um, my name is Alan Davidson. I am the director of the Open Technology Institute at New America. But my claim to fame here this morning is as a board member, a longtime board member of the Internet Education Foundation. And it's my uh, pleasure and delight to be here this morning to introduce our next keynote. Um, you know, for a long time, in the, especially in the early days of the Internet's popularity, I think it was quite uh, common to bemoan the difficulty in finding identifiable leadership on technology issues in the federal government. A lot has changed since those days, and uh, nothing more visibly than the creation of the role of chief technology officer, uh, a technology leader close to the president and charged specifically with thinking about all the different ways that technology uh, plays into the, p the big policy issues of the day, and also the ways that technology is changing the very relationship between people and their government. Um, we are very lucky to have with us today two of the three people who have held this role. Uh, the first is somebody who needs no introduction in this crowd. Our interviewer today will be Anish Chopra, the first chief technology officer of the United States, who's now uh, the co-founder and executive vice president of Hunch Analytics. Uh, he will be here today with uh, somebody who I'm delighted to introduce, uh, Megan Smith, our current chief technology officer. And I'll just have to editorialize for a moment. I've known Megan since, uh, since the 80s. Uh, we were like in nursery school or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Um, I can safely report that uh, even as an MIT undergrad, she was a bit of a legend as an engineer. That legend has really uh, only grown. Uh, she has incredible street cred in Silicon Valley. She did a long tour of duty as vice president at Google. Uh, and uh, she has somebody, she's somebody who has kind of almost unnatural ability to uh, think creatively about big technology problems think creatively about their solutions and uh, match the people who can make those solutions happen. She's a perfect person for this role. Uh, the president has been very lucky to lure her here uh, to take this on. We're very lucky uh, to have her here in Washington. And uh, I'm excited to see what she's going to do with it. So please join me in welcoming the country's first chief technology officer, interviewing our keynote speaker for today, the country's current Chief Technology Officer, Anish Chopra and Megan Smith. All right, here we go. Right. Rock and roll. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everyone. And thank you all for joining on this exciting day. Uh, it is, uh, as Alan said in the beginning, uh, an interesting time where Washington's capacity to harness the power and potential of technology, data, and innovation is really stepping up. I thought, Megan, if we might, just to get the crowd oriented to your uh, current priorities and passions, um, share a little bit about your role as CTO as you see it and the priorities that you've put forward. Right, right. Thanks, Anish. And it's incredible to be here um, with colleagues here in government. It's been fun to get to DC and see this new uh, sort of enter into this culture uh, coming from Silicon Valley. And just a quick thing, um, I find Washington to be incredibly entrepreneurial. And it's really familiar to me. Uh, having come from Silicon Valley. People get things done and they collaborate. It's really a, an interesting place and I really enjoyed coming and it's an honor to be here. Um, so the CTO job, which you began, uh, the president started on his first day and our role is uh, not really to be kind of a VP of Eng and run engineering the government. There are many people doing that already. The NASA team, we were just at the Department of Energy yesterday, lots of phenomenal technical teams are here. It's really an instigation job, you know, a, a, an architecture job where the, the sort of mandate is how do you help advise the president and his team on how to harness the power of technology, innovation, and data on behalf of the nation. And so it really moves with the times. So as you began, it was really the beginning of this office. And, and uh, we, we're focused on three areas. And I think you guys really stood up the, this first area, as well as the beginning, the seeds of the others. The first one is really the technology policy area. And having technical people at the table during those conversations. Um, so in addition to going out and talking to the incredible cohorts of, of Americans that will want to weigh in on a policy, having the actual engineers at the table, that's uh, one of the things we're doing. So the topics of the day, of course, are privacy, net neutrality, the spectrum auction, which is, is live right now, um, and a whole range of things, copyright, uh, patents, so to the, that laundry list of, of the conversations we're all having, and many people in the room are a big part of that. Um, a piece of that includes uh, 
uh, an area that, that we've been looking at, and Alex McGilvery is here who's been championing a lot of this, regulation reform. And how do we, sometimes we think about this area, how do we help with getting out of the way of America's top innovators? and yet protect the American people. So how are we being the best place in the world, the best country for innovation and technology so that the strongest entrepreneurs, the strongest inventors and scientists are coming here because we have a climate and a policy landscape for them to really do their thing. Sometimes I think you know, Henry Ford was not trying to disrupt horses. You know, he was just had a new idea. So how do we help those people do their things while we're still uh, learning and protecting the American people, dealing with privacy and all the things that we need to do to be the great nation. I mean, here we are in the museum with the First Amendment right on the wall, right? So keeping that. So I think that, you know, that's our first bucket. You guys did a huge amount of work on that uh, when you were CTO. The second area that we think about is really digital government. Yep. Um, and there's a couple pieces of digital government. Um, I was lucky, as were you, we, we worked at the beginning of the web. And uh, in the 90s, and it really feels to me like it's kind of 90, 96, 97, 98 in the category of digital government. It's the beginning. People don't yet see what's going to happen in this extraordinary way, but you're starting to see it. And you can feel it, and people are coming. What that looks like to me is, uh, you know, here we are in the country that uh, we are the country that created Amazon. You know, Jeff Bezos and his team were the country that created Facebook and Twitter and created the internet. Why shouldn't the websites and the mobile services and the way that we do customer service with the American people from the government, why shouldn't it be that good? Because we are that good as an American people. So the back end and the front end and all those pieces of our web services and the technologies that we use to run our government need to be that good. That's right. The IRS, the VA. And what's exciting is uh, not only have teams been working on that, but more people are coming. And I have, a, I have a, a technical term, TQ, like IQ and EQ, TQ, technical quotient. There's TQ people coming to government. We accidentally got into a position uh, as a government where we often really leverage technology well during war. And we bring the engineers in. You know, you see the beginning of computing with World War II and, and many of the things, the ENIAC project. Have people seen the movie Imitation Game? Uh, at Bletchley Park, Churchill standing up a very talented technical team that cracked the Enigma codes um, and, and helped see, uh, read what the Nazis were doing. So we bring techies in. We sort of get away with, from it a little bit in peacetime. And what we really need to do is have technical people at the table. So United States Digital Service, the 18F team, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which are like White House fellows who are technical, who do design thinking and front end and back end, embedding them in government. That's not to say that government should build everything. That would be not good. Uh, we should have our amazing uh, off-the-shelf products from tech, hosted products. We should have things that we contract for, custom. But there needs to be a person in the room who speaks that language. You don't want to go to a meeting in a foreign language and rely on the other side's interpreter. You just don't really, you won't be, you won't be confident in what you know. And it, not, not, bad things can happen. And in this case, we want to have a TQ people, technical people, in the conversation on our side mm -hmm. when we're doing contracting and work, or someone helping architect solutions who's thinking about customer service the way that Jeff Bezos and his team would. So that's exciting. The other part of that is, of course, open government, which you guys started a lot. The president's opened hundreds of thousands of data sets since the beginning, which you guys stood up. Um, how do we get more data released? Uh, some of the greatest examples are, of course, the weather data and the geo data and multi-billion dollar industries that stand on top of that open data. How do we get more out there and how do we gauge the development community? I always think uh, less RFPs and more APIs in this idea. So how can you have a marketplace of government tech where the APIs and the data are out there and people are bringing solutions? And that's really beginning to happen in a great way. So that's that area. Uh, the president's led a lot on the open government partnerships, 65 countries, lots of uh, nonprofit organizations and, and civil organizations in, and then the national action plan around open government and making progress there. So that's the third area. The fourth area is I think about the American people. Our greatest asset is the American people. And sometimes it, we get into kind of two countries, where there's the country that I've been living in, having had the chance to be at MIT with Alan and you know, out in Silicon Valley, and really part of this, what we nickname Innovation Nation. Um, and then there's some people who are really struggling, and they're not getting access at school or through university, through whatever places, to be a participant of bringing their passion 
to the world uh, and really be part of an innovation conversation that this country needs to lift our economy and our families. And so this is an area where we really think about, we almost come just like this government, place-based initiatives. Yeah. So how are we working to bridge the Americans who could be working together? What are we working on STEM education, uh, bringing our youth in? And we can talk more about the details of that. But those are our three areas. That's a very helpful overview. And I'd like to dive into each and every one of those areas, Megan. And just a quick, as we dive into that, Help uh, us understand you, who you are as we get into this conversation. Raise your hand if you work on the Hill, or, or if you work in the executive branch, or you have interest in influencing either side of those two. <laughs> OK, got it. That's helpful. Uh, so Megan, to set the stage for those three areas, could you just share a bit about what you've seen changed in these areas? What's mm -hmm. been different from, uh, you've only been here for a few months, but if you think a little bit about the last several years, do you see some uh, larger shifts in the capacity of the government on any of those three uh, priorities as you've laid out? Yeah, one of the things that's been really great is to watch uh, different leaders begin to put innovation labs into their agencies. So the HHS team, Health and Human Services, uh, Brian Siuak has brought an idea lab into HHS. There are extraordinary people in government yeah. and outside of government who have innovative ideas. And so there hasn't always been a place. And one of the things that's certainly uh, something that the tech industries have done forever, that's where the word skunk works, you know, comes from um, with the early digital equipment team and other others, uh, having a lab or a place where you can play. Um, and, and creating a review system that works within the agency. One of the tricks of making something like that is to make it big enough that it exists so you have some budget and some people and you get almost like entrepreneurs and residents who are coming from within or without and putting skills together and working on pilots and prototypes and doing things, you know, in Silicon Valley we call it minimum viable product. Make something that people can get a feel for what you're talking about. But you also don't want to over-resource it. If you, if you keep it at the right resource size, then you can kind of IPO it through the team. So for example, Niall, who's doing digital sciences and the CMS team, they can incubate new ideas for data science uh, and then get them straight through the Medicare and the standard systems so that we can really improve the scaled products that we have. So I think these innovation labs you see, USAID has the new global development lab. So a place where they can incubate. It's, it's not only um, them doing things, but it's also things like uh, they created this fabulous group called the Higher Education Solutions Network, yep. which matrixed lots of different universities from Berkeley to William & Mary to uh, Macari in Uganda. So sort of these faculty of students who are all over the world working on development engineering, whether it's new water systems, a new kind of healthcare delivery piece, a lot of mobile apps using you know SMS, not high-end smartphones. So getting those ideas in that talent group talking to each other and talking to the agency and getting sort of the, the blood flow around ideas really moving um, together with partners so that they can see better ways to, to execute. So I think seeing that, the second piece is really bringing this TQ or technical skills right into the government. Mm -hmm. um, the United States Digital Service, which the president started, is, is embedded as kind of a hub and spoke model within OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. And so you see a small team at the center place, and then in the agencies, they focus on five or six major projects to begin this year, and then we'll ramp from there. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites, of course, the Veterans Affairs. Yeah. And uh, they just attracted the number three employee of Amazon to come as an engineering manager into the VA. I mean, what's your second act after Amazon? as an engineer. You've built everything. I mean, this woman's code is delivering the boxes to your house with a smile, right, for 15 years plus. So what's her second act? Our veterans, the, you know, these amazing Americans who have delivered on behalf of the American races as great as the ones that she and others led before. So we're seeing that kind of talent come to government. So I, I'm very excited about that. I also really believe in open source and open APIs and what the tech communities and the open source communities can do. One of my favorite innovations in government that's happening is uh, the collaboration because of how the computer scientists work in open ways. So the UK team, who, is, who has the government digital service, the president was just in India, uh, Digital India, we're actually able to share code across countries. And so just like Code for America, we don't have to all have the same systems for every city. We can open, open source and share this stuff. Really seeing a ramp in that which is great. So there are, let me unpack a few of the themes that uh, you just shared, because I think that's useful for folks to understand a little bit of the current state of play. I'm going to connect two of them that you just shared. 
uh, this notion of internal government idea labs incubating, think of them as innovation pipeline managers to sort of test the idea, potentially validate them, and then eventually they scale up, as you mentioned, IPO'd in the agencies. And in the same spirit, you referenced uh, regulatory reform, in, and you frame that in much the same way, entrepreneurs outside of government uh, tackling ideas in a new and clever way, almost also seeking the opportunity to, to test, to validate, and then to eventually scale uh, in areas where we have regulation. Um, could you share a bit about how you think the these two logical uh, constructs, the idea that small ideas can grow up to be bigger ideas if managed appropriately, how will that change what it means in reality for someone who's trying to build a better way of uh, uh, serving healthcare uh, options up for patients or thinking about uh, other regulated sectors of the economy. Could you share a bit about your, your view on that, the intersection of, of innovation pipeline? Yeah, so, um, you know, ideas always start with a little crystal, uh, a small team, you know, in the Margaret Mead quote. So how do we as government get better at seeing those? Um, and then helping stand those up. And they can be inside an agency, like in an idea lab, where different folks have come together from inside, from outside, and there's a place to gather and to have a little bit of resource to begin to show what that is. I mean, it's become so much cheaper to make things uh, over time. And so the ability to mock up, and also just the way that we think about design thinking, um, just colleagues who've, who've advanced that field, you know, just taking paper, and mocking some stuff up, and having conversations, play acting with customers, and seeing if something is something that could work um, a, as an idea, all the way into you know, very difficult back end uh, fixes and upgrades that, that could be edited and made. So I think that's, that's one thing that we could do. The other is, um, you know, really are in a new position the, with what the internet is. I mean, sometimes people think there's this great, I don't know, if did, does people familiar with the Clue Train Manifesto? Uh, it's a fabulous uh, piece from early web. Just wildly about, popular in yeah, this wildly world, wildly <laughs> Go look it up. Uh, so there's a, the team just uh, published a new thing called New Clues. And uh, they, they list these things. It's very provocative. The first one is just, the internet is us. You know, sometimes people think it's plumbing or it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, interconnectivity. It's some kind of physical It's a series of tubes, layer. Megan. Didn't series, you get the yeah, memo? Series of, sorry, series of tubes. It's just us interconnected in a really effective new way, which is incredibly exciting. Um, number 12 actually says a, a very provocative point, which is uh, there hasn't been a prof as profound an invention since language. That's a pretty amazing point. And so sometimes I think about Model T days, like the very beginning of things. We're really early in what this is. But I think using this tool, this, this thing, this us, is allowing us to see things faster that we could uh, scale. So for example, the mayors. Incredible mayors were just here uh, from across the country for their, I think it's annual gathering. Yep. Um, so in talking to each of them, it's really struck me each of them have really solved sometimes, in many cases, many things, but at least one yep. thing at an elite level. The mayor of South Bend has incredible uh, sort of almost like Internet of Things instrumentation on their sort of utility systems yep. and are saving extraordinary money by just measuring where they have overflow on the sewage systems or where they're leaking water, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, we, we saw the president visit um, in, in Iowa, you know, the Chattanooga team. People have yep. solved municipal broadband. Yep. So those mayors. So who solved something for youth? Who solved something for homelessness? And if we could actually have all those mayors and their teams just cross share all that innovation, we would be in a whole other place. And I think we actually are starting to move into a position where you actually can do things like that. And so again, it's the same point of someone or some small team to seize the problem, has passion for solving it, fixes it. And then what we, we have in this case of the mayors, I think we have a distribution problem where we could use the internet to better distribute these amazing solutions and localize them and make them work appropriately and just get moving, really accelerate uh, our country into a much better position on behalf of so American let's take that, let's take that theme one more layer. You, you talked about the, um, one of the powerful uh, visions here is the sharing and also the building on top of. And so let's just take that, that uh, logic one step further. Maybe it's the public-private interface that mm -hmm. seems to be getting better in this notion of APIs, not RFPs. By the way, great line. Whoever said that, that's a great line. <laughs> Megan, well done. Uh, here's the question. So let's just take a, an example. Uh, obviously, healthcare.gov has now been relaunched and is working what, quite well. And maybe mm -hmm. you could say a bit about what you saw in the lessons learned for uh, how the technology team built up 
uh, that 2.0 marketplace. But an interesting story, uh, for those of you that may have seen it, uh, a startup called Stride Health basically took the raw data from healthcare.gov, among other government data sets. And now Uber is partnering with them to provide personalized insurance recommendations for drivers who might have back pain conditions as a priority search feature uh, across the plan. So you have a functioning, working, and successful healthcare.gov, and you have this essentially entrepreneurial version built on top that may be offering a value add. Do you see a world where there'll be more of this quasi-public-private effort? And what you think that's a good theme? Uh, how do you support that? Where, where's that going? I think that's fabulous. I mean, if you think about government as a platform to support the people in the different ways, and on the digital side, being able to use these new tools so that the base product that we could offer, in this case, um, the healthcare.gov offerings from H the HHS team, um, having them open that up for people to add features is terrific. You know, features and whole new products on top of that. So there's an entire economy that can build up uh, above that, which is very exciting. Um, and we haven't been in a position, you know, a decade or two ago to have that kind of resource, have that kind of open environment, you know, that really came with the, the, the 90s as uh, sort of open source and open systems and the ideas that came with the web entered into almost like in an evolutionary way with humanity. Um, I think uh, you were asking me a little bit about uh, watching the healthcare.gov team. Um, you know, I didn't work on that at all, but I, I, it was great to see in the second version, some, some things that happened. For example, just a simple thing. Uh, in the early version, the first version, it took many, many, many screens. You know, back to my Amazon analogy, like if you had to go through 70 screens to buy something from Amazon, that's really hard, right? And of course, there are going to be more than one or two because it's not a, a physical item that you're buying, something that needs some personal information, et cetera. But over time, you know, I think the, the 2.0 version took it down to from like 70, 60, 70 screens down to like 20. And they'll get smaller, and we'll get autofill. And you know, just making it customer-centric, I think they did a terrific job this time. And the results happen. You know, we can see in the dashboarding that there's more people signing up. And that's what that team, you know, the HHS team that's building and running that is seeing. Can we spend a few minutes in our last uh, segment here thinking about how you peel back one layer deeper in prioritizing across these areas? Uh, you laid them out quite well, thinking about the uh, sort of technology policy sets of issues uh, that many cases are sort of cross-cutting across lots of, of areas, uh, potentially some that are deeper in, in one, one sector. You spoke a lot about the notion of digital government and what that means in terms of openness and building up technical quotient uh, inside the agencies. And then you spoke about the country mm -hmm. and the gap that occurs in uh, everyone having a shot at living this better life. Could you talk a bit about where in those three do you see the greatest gap from your ideal state and use that as a basis for describing kind of where you put your priority across those three, just to give us some color as to the world as you see it today. I, you know, I think we have to push on all three, and especially the first one, because policy is something that the government has access to do, and it unlocks a lot of things and also protects. And so heavy emphasis there uh, from the team. Um, Alex McGrillery, Ryan Pachin's like here, way because uh, Ryan is here. Um, also, Matthew, Becky, others from the team, these guys were all working on this. Ryan's focusing much more if people want to follow up on the digital governance side. Alex working a lot on regulation reform and policy, and then we all work together. The one, I actually think that it's the American people. Yeah. Um, because, I don't know, I believe in surface area. More people doing things innovatively will solve more problems faster. Um, maybe I'll give you two examples. Please. So, uh, do, do you guys in here know about um, like tech meetups? Yes, no, people go into tech meetups, a few people, yes. Okay, so, got it, So More. people have tech meetups. Um, do you guys know about things like, uh, like Startup Weekend or a weekend where people hack a new company? Yes. So that's it. These are resources that are out there. A tech meetup is more like sort of a gathering that would be happening each month or, or twice a month or once a quarter where the techies on that topic and meetups happen. They could be happen on hiking or alternative medicine, whatever topics. I think it's interesting that there's uh, about 500 tech meetups a day in our country. So the president was in Boise, Idaho last week. And so we contacted the meetup teams. Turns out there's 14 tech meetups in Boise. One of them has more than 700 people in it that meets monthly on web development. There's another called Girl Develop It that meets twice monthly that does coding, has about 45 people in it. So you don't think of Boise and technology in that particular way that there's an entrepreneurial community there, but there is. Um, Startup Weekend. 
So Startup Weekend and these kind of startup hacks happen all over the world. If you actually go on the web and look at the map, they're happening all over our country. There was one last week weekend in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, and it was at a really cool space where the Bobcat team has an innovation center, a great space like the museum, and they gathered. Um, let's talk about the two Americas. The president was at Standing Rock Reservation uh, with uh, fabulous young, uh, the Native American youth there. Um, and recently the tribal nations came for the summit, mostly based on this one experience, which was he was talking to the youth there and found, talking to this one freshman kid, there's 40 kids in his class, uh, and three of the kids had already taken their lives, and 20 kids had tried. That's a haunting 20? statistic. Yes, to me, it's the most haunting statistic I've heard since I've been in government. So there's these two Americas. Now, Standing Rock Reservation is one hour drive, maybe one hour, 15 minutes, from Bismarck. So I contacted some folks that I met from Standing Rock and some folks that I had met from the startup and said, why don't you guys invite the kids? And the kids were excited, and a bunch of them went up there and had an incredible time this weekend. This and weekend? So, yeah. So I, to me, it's like the great American meetup needs to happen. Like, we need to barn raise this country. Somebody has a door over here and a this over there, and they're not talking to each other. Um, and yet they're right there hiding in plain sight. And in Silicon Valley, you could get off of a plane and uh, you literally would like walk anywhere in Silicon Valley and say, I'd like to I have a startup, I'd like to join us. Everyone would help you, right? It's that like is true. there's just people pouring out of coffee shops and driving around, text, everyone would help you. But in many of our cities, that innovation team is there. There's people doing startups, there are people with maker spaces, there's TEDx's, there's like the Burning Man equivalent. Like in Boise, Idaho, there was this thing called Hackfort, which is just like South by Southwest, you know, and it's on campus. This is happening all over our country, but it's hiding on the rest of the Americans. And so we need them to, we need to bridge that together. And I think that, that as we begin to do that, the American people will do the thing they've always done, which is kind of lead us into the future. Megan, I want to invoke our, uh our, our compatriot who couldn't join us today, Todd Park, yeah. uh, our, our second CTO, he had an expression for this that I'd like to get your comment on, and that was uh, when asked why has there been this divide, this, you, 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 we see it everywhere we go, uh, Todd's reaction, and I'll paraphrase, was that there's this wall of disbelief that seems to get in the way of people thinking that they can make it to that other side. And the big magic on our side has been to evangelize the fact that that wall of disbelief is paper thin. Mm -hmm. And that if we could find a way to punch a hole through that wall of disbelief, we could actually get folks to say, I'm in that reservation, but I can be in that tech meetup and I can see myself in the innovation nation. You want to react to Todd's description of this? Do you think of it in the right way? Is that, is that a reasonable way of thinking about it? And how would you respond to that and build on that as a message for folks thinking about where to go next? Yeah, and we can move the tech meetup to the reservation. That's right. So uh, yes, I, I think it's a pretty great visual. You know, like if you sort of punch through this, like somehow we're not seeing each other even though we're right there is, is, is critical. I think in some ways uh, there's a real opportunity with the schools to, to do more of this. We, in budget cuts, we accidentally kind of took away all the maker things from many of our kids. We took away art and shop and home ec. And one of the most popular classes at MIT is called How to Make Almost Anything. And so to me, that's like art and home ec and shop. It's like the thing that you could learn to do. Um, you know, we would never teach children not to write when we teach them to read. But we teach them all these math and science facts without giving them the ability to express the maker, discover, part of themselves not to do. And, and uh, so you see these master teachers in our country who are getting it done. And so again, it's like they're hiding in plain sight in the education system. Let's scale them and let's transform our education system. Let's make sure, you know, one of the big findings for STEM learning is you, the kids, most, some kids are listening because they've done the projects outside of class. But most kids aren't quite sure why are we learning this thing? What, what's the, what is it for? What does it do? Because they want to change the world. Yes. So if you can get them to understand that uh, you know, we need to bring Alan Shepard back to Earth, so it would be nice to do this trajectory and this math is related to that, or you know, like really context-based things, I think we could pull more kids in and got to do much more active learning, which science shows us is the best way to learn. Yes. We're at the end of our time, but Megan, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you just to say a word about the role of 
this is for everyone. Um, women and minorities tend to be underrepresented in, in this concept of innovation nation. Could you just close us out with your perspective? Obviously, being our first female CTO is a great, uh, again, breaking through uh, some barriers. Tell us a bit about that, your perspective on women and minorities in this innovation nation, and then we will move to the next topic. Sure. And uh, actually, I think Kathy McMorris Rogers is speaking next. Is That's that right? right. Yeah. And uh, the first time I ever came to go to the Hill, actually, the Republican Congresswomen had asked us to come talk about STEM. So it's an honor to be here with her and with Jared Paulus, who I worked with on the beginning of the web, who's I think here as well. Um, you know, the conversation continues around how do you get people to physically try this stuff? It's, it, I sort of have an expression, practice makes permanent, and that's true in any kind of innovation. It's true with our kids. The more they try this, the more they'll understand. That happened for me. I went to school uh, in inner city Buffalo, and we had mandatory science fair. So we were required to practice that doing. And it taught us not only that it's interesting and fun, but also it taught us some confidence that we could do it. And it wasn't like Mount Everest. You actually just start it, just yeah. like when you learn to write. You yeah. start with some letters. And eventually, you can write an essay. So same thing with science and tech. And we need all our children to experience that. The other one that I think is incredibly significant that we could get done is um, the unconscious bias that we have in our media around uh, the visualization and the actors and the way we portray who does what. So there's, there's stereotyping that happens around race and gender. There's also, um, do you guys know a thing called the Bechdel test? Yes, no, the Bechdel test is, uh, is from uh, movies. So uh, if you're watching a movie and there's more than two women characters, major or minor, if they have a conversation with each other that's not about a man, most movies can't pass that, and especially in science and technology. Are you serious? That's, yeah. that's, uh, that's pretty bad. Yeah, well, it's partly because there's so few women writers that you're getting this one perspective. So that, that's happening in science and tech. And uh, I'll give you an example. I mentioned the imitation game. It turns out that actually Bletchley Park, the true story is that uh, more than half of the Bletchley team were women at the elite math level, too. And so Joan Clark, who's the character that's portrayed with Alan Turing, is not an anomaly. She, not only is she a real character, she's true, she's true in history as he is, but um, there were a lot of technical women. At ex the movie Jobs, another one. Um, I have friends who were in the Mac team. The Mac team, if you look at the Rolling Stones photographs, of uh, who made the Macintosh with Steve. Seven men and five women appear in all those photos. Oh, wow. But in the section of the movie from Hollywood, accidentally, no women were in cast for the Mac scene. No, none of those women, Susan Kerr, Joanna Hoffman, any of those elite Americans who did that work. When you look at the movie Apollo, most people don't know Katherine Johnson. Does anybody here know Katherine Johnson? Uh, Katherine Johnson is the African-American woman who calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission, and she lives in Maryland. Wow. So we need her. Let's She's celebrate incredible. these folks. Yeah. We just need them to appear so that all, all right. young men and women and people can, can see them. Megan, we got to write those okay. wrongs. Yeah. Our CTO, Megan Smith. Thank you, everybody. Well done. Well done.